Uh, one of the reasons is because uh, during Vietnam they, they, were, they were tremendously embarrassed by what was going on. And then uh, in the 1970s and 1980s they tested the, uh, uh, the troops in Europe and what they discovered was that a third of them were, had to use some kind of drug. Um, now the interesting thing about that is we couldn't, at the time, we couldn't test uh, marijuana. So these guys were on heavy drugs. These guys were on speed, they were on uh, barbiturates, they were on opiates. Because that's all we could test, and, and a third of them tested positive. It was a shock to everybody. Uh, so the military got embarrassed. This is, uh, this is during the Carter administration. And uh, then Ronald Reagan took over, uh, uh, well, his administration took over in, in the 1980s. And he swore that he was going to crack down on all the drugs in the military. Um, of course, we were still we were still drawing down from Vietnam. There was a lot going on. Uh, they were kicking people out of the service. They were they were rifting people. They were they were removing them from the service. Uh, we didn't need them anymore. Uh, their jobs were no longer necessary. Uh, so uh, it was really an interesting time in the service. I uh, of course, like I told you before, one of my jobs you know, when I was in the service was uh, drug testing. Uh, and it wasn't a lot of fun. I would rather have done anything else but uh, than watch it, somebody urinate, collect a urine specimen. I didn't have to do the testing. All I had to do was the collection. But the collection was extremely important, uh, as we're going to talk about in just a second. Uh, so then we had uh, Afghanistan, and then we had Afghanistan and Iraq uh, kicked in. Uh, in the uh, in 2001, um, and at that point, uh, they decided that they weren't going to draft people into the military; that they were going to use their reservists and their uh, uh, national guard troops. So they were deploying uh, people uh, from uh, civilian life uh, into the military, and they realized that they were going to have a really serious problem if they didn't if they didn't check these people coming in. And that's what they did. They did 100% random testing for all active duty uh, personnel. And when we say random testing, I think I explained to you how they were doing it. Uh, they were uh, randomly selecting uh, the last two numbers of somebody's social security number. Uh, sometimes it would represent 100 people. Sometimes it would represent three people. It really all depended on the base and how large the base was. Uh, there were some bases that were so large that uh, collecting urine specimens was a full-time job for somebody. As you can imagine, that wasn't the most fun thing in the whole wide world. Uh, one of the things that you had to do, uh, they collected the urine specimen. Uh, they were in an uh, open urinal that you could that you could watch. This is, I was this for male, of course, females that had uh, they used toilets, but uh, uh, for males. Uh, they had an open urinal, the guy would collect his specimen, he would put the top on, uh, he would screw the, the, the cap on, and uh, then you'd put a piece of uh, uh, legal tape over it, uh, and he would sign it and you would sign it. Uh, and that way, <clears throat> and then you put it in a box. Uh, but that way, if he signed it and you signed it, uh, of course you knew that it was a good urine uh, because you had watched him collect the urine, uh, it was also, you were also supposed to, uh, well, there were two things you were supposed to do. Uh, you did a specific gravity to make sure it wasn't diluted out too much uh, by wa with uh, water. Uh, the other thing is you touched it uh, so that you could tell if it was uh, warm enough or not as a urine. Because people are 98.6, their urine comes out at about 95, 94 degrees. Uh, so the idea was that you were supposed to make sure that that was a good urine. And as we are going to find out in just a minute, uh, when we talk about drug testing, uh, there are ways to cheat. And so the idea was that uh, you had to uh, uh, figure out what those ways were so that you could make sure that they didn't do it. Uh, so what they decided to do was 100% random testing for all active duty personnel, uh, con uh, conduct uh, ra random drug testing on all military personnel within 72 <coughs> hours of entering the active service. And as we're going to find out, they were uh, hitting just about all the drugs that they could possibly hit. Welcome. Here, let me send you in. There we go. Gotcha. Okay. 
Uh, separate uh, positive testing personnel from the military. Uh, in other words, they had zero uh, tolerance as far as uh, testing was concerned. If somebody tested positive, they did a medical evaluation of that select individual, and if they were, if they were positive and they had no reason for, for taking speed or whatever else uh, they were uh, tested positive for, they kicked them out of the service. They didn't even mess around with them. These were, these were personnel that had been in the military for an extended length of time because they were National Guard and, and reservists. And because of that, of course, uh, they decided that uh, they weren't going to they weren't going to play games with these people. If they had been active duty, duty personnel, of course, uh, they would have sent them to treatment. But because they were National Guards, National Guard and reservists, uh, if they had any problems with them, they just kicked them out. They removed them from the service. Uh, the te they uh, t test uh, the mandatory test panel uh, to include new drugs. And of course, there were new drugs coming uh, out all the time. Uh, during the first Gulf War in the 90s, uh, crystal meth all of a sudden uh, hit, hit the uh, streets. What do they call it? It had a, it had a new uh, ice something. It was, uh, it was kind of interesting. Anyway, there were new drugs, and all the new drugs have, have different chemical structures. And because of that, uh, we had to make sure that we were hitting everything. Uh, maintain 100% mandatory testing for DOD uh, civilian personnel. So not only were we testing military people, but we were also testing uh, the civilians that were working in Afghanistan and Iraq as well. Why in the world would we need to do that? Once upon a time, we planned, uh, we, when we planned wars, and of course my wife was, uh, this was one of her jobs when she was in the military, was, was war planning. Uh, when we plan a war, what we normally plan is for only military personnel to be in a war zone, and to be in a combat zone. But unfortunately, between Vietnam and, uh, and this happened during the Reagan administration, uh, during the, uh, between Vietnam and uh, the Gulf Wars, uh, one of the things that happened was that they decided that it was too expensive to maintain such a large military. Now that the Cold War was over with, we didn't need to do that. Uh, so we started uh, sending more and more civilian personnel into war zones, uh, or at least that was the plan. The other idea was that, well, geez, we, the Russians are gone, so we don't have to worry about anybody. Uh, so probably we're not going to be getting into war. We're spending too much money for nothing. And uh, so they decided to contract out things. And one of the things they contracted out was medical, uh, was medical service, which was just the dumbest thing in the whole wide world. Anyway. Uh, so, uh, so there were a lot of civilians that we were sending into the war zones, unfortunately. And of course, uh, if it's a military person, you can you have uh, complete you have absolute control over that person for 24/7. But if it's a civilian, you only have control over them, and you don't even have complete control. But you have the degree of control that you have is only over them for when they are are actually working. Uh, the rest of the time, they can do anything that they want. So one of the things that we decided uh, that we needed to do is make sure that these guys were juiced up uh, out in the field. Uh, this was a really serious problem with a group called uh, Blackwater. Uh, they were contract security personnel uh, who came in, and these guys were kind of, these were mercs, in essence. And uh, they tended to shoot, just shoot everything up. I mean, they just went berserk. You remember the, the in Afghanistan, or no, it was in Iraq that they shot up that wedding, wedding party and killed, I don't know, 24 people or something. It was just ridiculous, including the bride and groom, of course. As stupid as that is. <clears throat> anyway, one of the things that happened was uh, um, they had a, a part of their contract was that uh, we could only test them a select um, uh, amount of times. That's one of the reasons why they lost their contract. Uh, for one thing, they kept killing people that they shouldn't have been killing. And the other thing was we couldn't test them. And it turned out that they were all that a lot of them were on speed and steroids and all kinds of nutty stuff. Anyway, so we needed to do drug testing. Uh, there's a reason why drug testing has shown a 66% drop in positives from 1988 to 2004. 1988, uh, that was the last year Reagan was president. Um, uh, we, we had a really serious problem. As I told you before, uh, in the military, of course, we had one-third of the personnel in the year were, 
were positive for uh, one drug or another. So we were, we were really hit, hitting pretty hard. Uh, we were getting a lot of positives uh, in the 80s. And then in the 90s, things started to, to decline a little bit. But this was the first time anybody had ever been tested. And everybody thought that they could fool the system and that they could bribe the, uh, uh, the collector and, and that, those kinds of things. One of the things they, they discovered was that there, that there were other individuals that had a lot of integrity. Uh, and because of that, uh, they, uh, they had to be clean in order to test negative. Uh, so by 2004, the uh, number of positives had dropped uh, 66%. Uh, a lot of people thought that they were smarter than the system, and it turned out that they weren't smarter than the system. The system's always changing, uh, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, we had more uh, accurate tests uh, that we came up with, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Self-reported positives have increased by 30%. These are individuals that come in, they did, didn't realize they were going to be drug tested today. Uh, they got uh, stoned last night. Uh, so when they come in, they go, you know, I'm just, I, I, I smoked pot last night. My, my urine's going to be positive. And because of that, of course, these were self-reported positives. And if they self-report, usually uh, the punishment is, isn't nearly as severe. Uh, drug users will avoid applying for jobs at businesses that require a drug test. And of course, uh, this, this happened to my son. My son doesn't use drugs, uh, but he was working at a bar where they smoked pot. And of course, he would stop them any time he possibly could because it's against or he was in California. It was against a lot of smoke in a building in, in California, but it's doubly, uh, at the time, of course, uh, marijuana is illegal now, but uh, that was, you know, that was two crimes that they were committing. And, of course, he's kind of a boy scout. Uh, but he was afraid he was going to get secondhand smoke. He was going to get a positive from secondhand smoke. And uh, he was applying for jobs, trying to get out of the bar. I don't remember what jobs he was applying for, but he was real upset. <laughs> Poor kid. He's running all over the bar. And this is a huge, uh, this is a huge bar. He's running all over the place trying to get these guys to stop uh, rolling their blunts on the, on the bar, which evidently was a song or a rap song at the time. And he just went berserk. <clears throat> Kept getting into fights. He's not a very big person. He's about five foot eight. Weighs well, maybe 190, 200 pounds. Uh, but he's all muscle, and so he scares people when he when he growls at them. <laughs> so he was <laughs> he was growling at people all over the bar. There are ways to beat the drug test, though most of them depend on non-observant uh, specimen collector collectors. And of course, there are ways to, to beat the system. Uh, and everybody thinks they're smarter than everybody else, and it turns out that they're not. Uh, reasons for drug testing include uh, pre-employment testing, uh, for-cause testing, in other words, you're acting erratically and they want to know if you have uh, drugs in your system. Uh, random testing, uh, post-accident testing, of course, if you have an accident, they want to know uh, if you were inebriated at the time uh, in one way or another. Uh, periodic testing, which is done in the military, uh, in the military, uh, you have to be tested at least once a year. Uh, rehabilitation testing of criminals on probation. Uh, testing for compliance of addicts and treatment. Testing by medical examiners to determine cause of death. Uh, Twelve states allow for testing of welfare recipients. Uh, somebody got a wild hair up somewhere. Anyway, <laughs> there are 12 states that want their welfare people, make sure their welfare people aren't on drugs. Uh, the most widespread, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the most widespread testing, of course, is in the military. Uh, federal government employees are tested twice a year, uh, and it's, it's supposed to be random, but of course nothing is random in the, in the, uh, in the government. Uh, Pre-employment uh, drug testing uh, in public uh, safety positions like transportation. Uh, they test each pilot before he gets in an airplane. It's tested, is drug tested, which is a good idea. Uh, bus drivers are tested uh, quarterly, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you certainly don't want your pilot to be have, have had a couple cocktails before he gets in the plane. 
Uh, drug treatment facilities, of course, uh, they do testing as well. Drug testing can be conducted on any substance from the body. Uh, we can use, usually we use urine. Um, if, uh, if the guy can't collect a urine specimen, then we'll, we can draw his blood. Uh, the reality is that one of the best ways to test for drugs are, are, is uh, by looking at their hair, by testing their hair. Uh, but we can also test saliva, sweat. Uh, if the guy's uh, no longer with us, uh, we can test his tissue and, uh, and find out if he's been on drugs. Uh, fingernails are good, actually, as confusing as that is. Uh, standard uh, drug testing, that tells you uh, whether they've been on, they were on drugs uh, for an a extended length of time. Uh, that tells you, you know, over the last six months uh, whether you were on drugs or not. Uh, the standard drug tests uh, for, we test for amphetamines, uh, cannabinoids, uh, now we do. Uh, as I said before, we didn't have a test for it in the, in the 70s uh, and early 80s. Uh, we didn't uh, develop that until the 80s. Uh, cocaine, opioids, uh, phenocyclidine, uh, and alcohol. We can test that with the drug, uh, standard drug test. Um, sometimes we think maybe they're on something else and we can test for other drugs. Uh, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and methadone, which looks like opiates, uh, but it has a different chemical structure. So we have to look at for, for methadone specifically. Darvon has a, a, a different uh, uh, chemical structure as well, as does methoquinone. Uh, so if we, we, if we had, uh, suspect those uh, other, other drugs, uh, then we have to test for them specifically. Uh, drugs that are normally not tested for but can be added if suspected, LSD, fentanyl, uh, psilocybin, MDA, and all the other designer drugs. Fentanyl, of course, is a, an opioid, uh, but it has such a strange chemical structure that you don't pick it up with the normal uh, testing. If you're looking for fentanyl, you have to look for fentanyl specifically. And this is one of the reasons why after Prince uh, overdosed, uh, it, took, uh, it took a couple weeks before we found out that he was, uh, had uh, fentanyl poisoning uh, with, uh, uh, what's his name, the guy from the Heartbreakers. What's the guy's name? He overdosed on fentanyl. All right. Funny looking guy. Do you know who I'm talking about? You don't know who I'm talking about? The Heartbreakers? Uh, isn't that what his name was? Anyway, he, uh, uh, he had three different types of fentanyl in his system. Uh, but they, they knew that he was on fentanyl, so they had to look, they looked for it right away. And we found out that he committed suicide. And, uh, Methods of testing include thin layer chromatography. I don't, it, it, this is really important as far as I'm concerned because I was involved in all this stuff and I've done, I've done all of these different types of assays. Uh, but uh, when I was in the military uh, and I was going through lab school, uh, three quarters of, of, of my graduating class went into drug testing and the other one quarter uh, went into, lab, uh, in, into the lab. Um, potentially, this is a far more lucrative field than, uh, than just lab work. Uh, so thin layer chromatography, uh, this method tests for uh, a wide variety of chemicals and is very sensitive to minute amounts of any chemical. Now we, get a, we, can, we can tell if something is positive. The problem is that, uh, that you can't differentiate between chemicals with similar structures such, such as ephedrine and amphetamines, they look alike. Uh, so uh, if we do that and we get a positive, then we use uh, another type of, uh, then we test it, test it again. And this is one of the reasons why uh, when we collected the drug urine, we had to collect a select amount. Because if it was positive, we didn't have to do it one time, we would have to test it again. And actually what happened with the military, if you got a positive result, then you ran it again on thin layer chromatography. And then if it was still positive, then you ran a, uh, uh, usually we used a, 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 an emit test or an RIA. Uh, there are other types of tests uh, that, are very, that are more sensitive. The enzyme multiplied uh, immunoassay technique, the emit test, the radio immunoassay, uh, RIA, and the enzyme immunoassay, the EIA, are all tests that are more sensitive than the, uh, than the thin layer chromatography. 
Uh, emit tests to use antibiotics to antibodies to uh, seek out specific drugs. Uh, it is very sensitive and rapid, but it cannot determine concentration and produces several false positives. For example, poppy seeds, if you eat a, a bagel with poppy seeds on it, uh, it will test positive for heroin. Uh, ibuprofen, strangely enough, uh, tests positive for marijuana. Uh, and uh, VIX vape, vapor inhalers uh, test pos positive for crank as confusing as that is. So if you take ibuprofen, you've got a cold, so you take ibuprofen and you're using an inhaler, you're gonna, it's gonna look like, and you had a poppy seed bagel for breakfast, it's gonna look like you're really juiced up. You've got heroin, <laughs> marijuana, and crank in your system, as not funny as that may seem. Uh, method, uh, other methods of drug testing, gas chromatography, mass spectro uh, spectrometry, spectrometry, Combined and gas liquid chromatography. Uh, if you ever watch uh, NCIS, it's on tonight, by the way. Uh, but if you ever watch that, she talks about her mass spec, and what she's talking about is uh, it's gas chromatography and, and uh, mass spectrometry. It's a, it's a machine that does both. It's really kind of exciting. Uh, this system is the most sensitive. It's accurate and it's reliable. Without, uh, it's the most uh, reliable method of drug testing. This system is so accurate because the technique actually breaks each chemical into fragments and then it reads the fragments, as exciting as that is. And one of, it takes a while. This is not that rapid. Uh, this method eliminates false positives and false negatives uh, because it, is not only, it not only identifies the chemical structure of the drug, but it cross-references it with the metabolites that it produces. And if you've ever watched this on television, uh, this is actually true. So, what will happen is that uh, when they get a result, they not only know what the, the, the major drug was, but they know uh, all the metabolites. And because they know all the metabolites, uh, if uh, Edison and I are both making, what do you want to make? Crystal meth. We, we both have our own formula for crystal meth. Uh, then uh, if uh, the guy was using Edison's uh, crystal meth, then uh, the, his, it will fractionate differently than mine. So we can tell the difference between my crystal meth and your crystal meth, and that's what happens. Uh, so they can, if they get uh, two two uh, specimens of heroin, for example, they can tell which one was was came from China six months ago and which one came from China three months ago. I know it's really kind of exciting, uh, but but the reason is because of the metabolites. It, it breaks down the metabolites. So there you go. <clears throat> I mean, it's really kind of exciting. This test is very expensive and requires highly trained operators, and of course that's one of the reasons why we see it on television from time to time. Very, very accurate, but it's, ex it's really expensive, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, of course, the military doesn't want to pay that much money for this kind of stuff, so they, they do the cheapest method that they can find, mainly because Congress is always jumping on their backs and telling them to stop spending so much money. Uh, hair analysis can be done as most chemicals taken uh, into the body are represented in the keratin of the hair follicle. Hair analysis tells the tester what drugs have been used while that specific hair follicle has been alive. So as I told you before, you can use a hair follicle and it not only will tell you if they're clean today, but they can tell you if they were clean as long as that hair's been around. Radio amino assay tests are run on their hair fo follicles. Uh, confirmation is done with gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. And there you go. <clears throat> See, all this makes a lot of sense to me, but these are probably just words to you. Uh, drugs can be detected on saliva sweat or on the, in your breath. Uh, these tests are easier to obtain as they are less invasive, but they also only serve as screening tests and they are prone to contamination. The alcohol breathalyzer is a good example of a breath test. Uh, Follow-up tests should always be done to confirm any results. Uh, they are looking for a breath test for marijuana. Uh, because, but there is a problem with that. Uh, of course, we know that a select amount of alcohol makes you inebriated, and you drive very relatively poorly. Um, with marijuana, we're not exactly sure how much marijuana makes you erratic or drive erratically. Uh, but we do have a test for uh, marijuana. It's a breath test uh, for marijuana. <laughs> Has to do with fat. 
as confusing as that is. There are many factors that influence the length of time a drug will remain detectable in the person's system, uh, what type of drug it is, uh, the absorption rate uh, uh, due to uh, how much exercise you've had, uh, metabolism, rate of distribution in the body, excretion rate, the method employed for testing. Uh, so when we talk about uh, how long a, a drug will stay in your system, it really all depends. Uh, if you have a lot of fat and, and uh, very little muscle, uh, then that will, will change the ratio of the rapidity of it moving out of your system. If you exercise a lot, then uh, your metabolism is very high and you'll move uh, drugs out of your system much, much faster. Uh, so there's, there are a lot of different things uh, that uh, come into play uh, when we're talking about drugs. Uh, detection range for psychoactive drugs, alcohol stays in your system for three to five days. Uh, amphetamines, two to four days. Methamphetamines, two to four days. Barbiturates uh, that are short acting uh, stay in your system for about 24 hours. Uh, intermediate uh, barbiturates stay in your system for 40 to 80 hours. Uh, diazepam, which is a long act, that's Valium. Uh, it stays in your system for 7 to 30 days. And this is one of the reasons why uh, when we have somebody with, uh, with anxiety, we will give them diazepam, we'll give them Valium, uh, because it, uh, it's a long-acting uh, drug and it'll stay in your system for an extended length of time, which is what you're looking for if you're trying to, to, to break that cycle of anxiety. Uh, cocaine or crack, and cra or crack, whichever uh, 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 way that you're taking in your your cocaine uh, will stay in your system for about six to eight hours. Uh, benzyl, benzyl, benzyl economine, ec uh, that's, that's uh, crystal meth, will stay in your system for uh, two to three days. Uh, marijuana, if you use it one time, will stay in your system for about one to three days. Uh, four joints, if you smoke four joints a week, which isn't that much. Uh, four to seven days, if you use it every day, 10 to, 10 to 15 days. And if you use it like all the time, uh, stay in your system for 30 to 60 days. Uh, so it really all depends on how much you're smoking. Uh, nicotine, uh, tobacco will stay in your system for about 12 hours. Uh, detection range of psychoactive drugs, opioids, uh, 48 to 56 hours. Um, the buprenorphine uh, conjugates will stay in for about five to seven days. Uh, codeine, one to, one to two days. Uh, heroin, two to four days. Uh, hydromorphone, uh, Dilaudid, will stay in your system for two to four days. Methadone, two to three days. Uh, maintenance, methadone, will stay in your system for seven to nine days. Morphine, two to four days. Oxycodone, uh, two to four days. Uh, Darvon, uh, six to 48 hours. Uh, PCP, if you just use it every once in a great while, it'll stay in your system for about two to eight days. And if you use it all the time, it'll stay in there for months. Uh, LSD, of course, uh, and its metabolites will stay in your system for two to four days. And ecstasy will only stay in your system for 30 to 48 hours. Uh, drug testing does, does uh, seem to be reliably accurate, but it, of course, is not infallible. Uh, false positives can happen. Uh, Dextromethorphan, which is what you use in cough syrup, uh, has been uh, misidentified as opiates. Unfortunately, it looks about the same. Uh, some herbal teas have been known to test uh, cocaine positive, so be careful what type of tea you're drinking. Uh, poppy seeds, of course, can be misidentified as, uh, as opiates. Errors have uh, also been found after testing personnel mishandled specimens, and of course that's the biggest problem. Uh, of course, they always blame the guy that's doing the test, and uh, you know, it all depends on the guy, <laughs> whether they're good or not. Uh, it's not a lot of fun. This is not a lot of fun. You're, you're working with pee all the time. I don't know if you know what pee smells like, but sniff it sometime <laughs> the next time you take a quiz. Uh, this guy is, uh, these people are working with this, uh, that's all they do. Uh, so what does what in the world does the room smell like? It smells like a, a urine is exactly what it smells like. Um, if there is bacteria in the urine before they ship it, uh, the urine will, will have a very strong odor. Uh, and of course, some people have bacteria in their urine. They have urinary tract infections or whatever. 
And of course, and the strange thing is, oh, maybe I shouldn't tell you. The strange thing is, you can tell a lot of different things. If the guy's got uh, gonorrhea, uh, <laughs> or the lady's got gonorrhea, a lot of times uh, you can smell it in the urine. It's horrible as that may seem. If the lady is pregnant, she'll put off hormones that uh, are detectable, as confusing as that is, and they have a specific odor. Anyway, uh, however, the most common laboratory errors are false negatives. Uh, specimens can be manipulated by the testee to tr uh, create a negative test when the testee is actually positive. Uh, <coughs> they can introduce clean urine into to dirty urine, and it usually will, will dilute it out enough so that it doesn't turn positive. Uh, they can conceal containers, and this is one of the reasons why we had to touch uh, the container when we collected a, a drug urine, uh, to make sure that it was body temperature. Uh, if it was colder than that, then, uh, um, then we made them collect another specimen. Uh, they can inject, uh, and this is what they do, this is what uh, uh, football players will do, uh, baseball players will do this if they are drug tested. Uh, they will inject somebody else's urine into their bladder. And so when they urinate, they're urinating clean urine. If you think I'm kidding, I'm not. Uh, in order to get that uh, urine into it, there's two ways to do it. Either you can catheterize the person and fill their bladder up with clean urine, or you can take a needle and uh, you, can, you can stick it through the abdominal wall into the, uh, into the bladder and, and uh, shoot uh, clean urine in, in there. Does that sound stupid? They'll do anything. I, we had a guy that uh, he took a, ho a hose, uh, he had a, a, a bladder on his, on his, he taped a bladder to his uh, side, and he ran a hose down beside his penis, and then he opened the thing up when he was supposed to collect the urine specimen. The urine was almost as warm as it should be, not quite, and that's how he got caught. Uh, I caught him. <laughs> Dumb shit. <sighs> He said, come on, man, be cool. <clears throat> if they're going to do that, do it right. I have never been cool. Come on, man, be cool. Never been cool. <laughs> he, he, I told him he could kiss my ass. <laughs> he got pissed. He was a big guy, too. Um, I, uh, in Vietnam, they had to have guards uh, stand beside the... Uh, the guy that collected the urine because people would kill him. They killed the collector, the drug collector. I only did that one time. And nobody, nobody told me so. Okay. <laughs> Substances that have been introduced into the urine. This is stupid. Uh, they'll, they'll put anything in urine just to mess it up. Um, <laughs> it gives them, if, if it gives them false, uh, false negative, usually it gives them a false negative. Uh, but you can put aspirin in there. You just drop an aspirin tablet in there. Uh, golden seal tea uh, works. Uh, niacin, niacin turns your urine uh, blue, which is always fun. Zinc sulfate, which also turns your urine, it turns your urine a greenish blue. It's kind of a turquoise color. Uh, bleach, uh, clear water, ammonia, Drano, hydrogen peroxide, lemon juice, liquid soap, vinegar, visine. We had this one guy that came in and he couldn't, he had, he had a shy bladder, so he couldn't, he couldn't collect a specimen. So finally he collects a specimen. What does he do? He goes over and walk to wash his hands. Well, you can't, sometimes they turn the tap off, as interesting as that is. But uh, we didn't, of course, and he went over and washed his hands. Well, of course, he had to collect another urine specimen because he turned the water on. And we told him not to do that, or I told him not to do that. Anyway, oh, shit. Let's see what, this is on tape. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ammonia, Drano, Drano, uh, hydrogen peroxide, lemon juice, liquid soap, vinegar, visine. They'll squirt anything in there trying to, trying to mess up their, their urine if they know it's positive. Uh, of the people over 65, 83% take at least one prescription drug per day. 30% uh, take eight drugs or more a day. I take three, four, four. Uh, two blood pressure medicines. I have. A, I take a statin and I, I uh, take an aspirin, uh, baby aspirin every day.
Uh, Thirty percent will take eight drugs or more a day. Uh, Seventeen percent of people over 60 in the United States abuse alcohol and legal drugs. Unfortunately, our society doesn't pursue elder drug abuse and alcoholism as fervently as they do those uh, these problems in younger individuals. I guess they figure, what the hell, their soul, who cares what happens to them anyway. Only 37% of elderly alcoholics are identified as compared to 60% of younger abusers. Uh, I had, uh, my, my wife had an uncle uh, who uh, started drinking more and more and more and more, uh, and by the time he died, he was uh, a raging alcoholic. But he didn't start uh, drinking heavily until after his wife died, and then he just, he would buy a gallon of rum, and he'd put it in the middle of his table. And uh, you, you could ask him when he bought it, and sometimes he'd lie to you, and sometimes he'd tell you the truth. But he was drinking that gallon of rum probably, uh, it only took him four or five days to, to, to down the whole gallon. Uh, and by that time, of course, he really didn't care what was going on. He was in his 70s, he's retired. Uh, drugs do not uh, work the same in the system of an elderly individual as they do with someone who is younger. And this is something that you have to remember uh, if you're ever around an older individual and they're giving, they're giving that person the same dosage that they're giving to you, for example. Uh, this happened to my mother. She was 90. She's in her 90s. And, of course, they had never seen anybody in their 90s because most people in that part of the world uh, died in their 70s and 80s of lung cancer or whatever. And here's my mother. She's in her 90s, and they're trying to hit her with the same dosages that they hit uh, younger people with, and they almost killed her uh, uh, several times. Enzymes in the elderly tend to be less active than in younger people. This tends to make drugs more potent in older people. Uh, for example, the loss of liver enzymes means that an individual 70 years old will get the uh, same effect from a 10 milligrams of Valium as a 21 year old who takes 30 milligrams of Valium. And this is one of the things that you have to remember. Uh, the most frequently abused drugs after alcohol for the elderly are, are Vicodin, uh, narcotic cough syrup, uh, from, oddly enough, Darvon and other opioid analgesics, uh, Clonopin, uh, over-the-counter sedatives, over-the-counter sleep aids, uh, Prozac, Zoloft, and Boost Bar. Um, sleep aids, uh, the Z drugs, uh, Somonex is a Z drug. While no, not everyone takes their medications uh, in the pres uh, prescribed manner, the elderly tend to have more problems with uh, than other people do, and that's usually because they are stupid. No, they, they can't remember things. <laughs> they just can't remember things. It's not their fault. Or is it? My damn wife, uh, oh, geez, this is on tape. Uh, <laughs> My wife, uh, sometimes she forgets to take her pills. Well, how, she doesn't take her pills every day. So how in the world can you forget to take your pills? Sometimes she forgets. She forgot a whole week of pills. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about what, what happened next because the next chapter is about uh, prescription drugs. But she forgot, she forgot to, to put them out one, one week. So, uh, well, you know, she's got this pill caddy. I don't have a pill caddy, but she's got this pill caddy. And she just forgot to fill the thing up. So she just didn't do it every day. I don't know what she was thinking. Oh, good. Well, my pill caddy doesn't have any pills in it, so I'm free. I don't have to take any drugs for the rest of the week. I don't know why it was in my front of mine. Anyway, she's younger than me. <laughs> she shouldn't have this problem. Overuse, uh, taking more or uh, many different types of drugs that, uh, than they are prescribed. Uh, underuse, failing to take appropriately prescribed drugs or the correct dosage. Erratic use, failure to take drugs in the right dosage or at the right time. There are drugs you're supposed to take in the morning, drugs you're supposed to take in the afternoon. Anyway, you have to do that. You have to take it in the afternoon. You can't just like. Take it any time you feel like it. It doesn't work that way. Uh, contraindicated use, uh, uh, incorrect drug uh, being used causing an adverse reaction or drug re uh, in inactivity. Abuse and addiction, using drugs for non-medical purposes despite negative consequences. And this can be a problem. 
Uh, common drugs uh, abused by elders, nicotine, 94% of, of all 430,000 premature deaths from smoking are people that are over 50 years old. Uh, tobacco's effects are actually more pronounced than the elderly because of their inability to put toxins as they did when they were younger. As you get older, your liver uh, becomes less efficient. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that you're drinking alcohol. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that you're ingesting other toxins. It just becomes less efficient. Uh, so by the time you're in your 90s and 100s, uh, your liver's not working very well. It's not clearing uh, medication out of your system very well at all. So what we get is a buildup effect of some of these drugs. Elderly smokers have uh, twice the mortality risk of cardiovascular disease than non-smoking elders. Very rare to find somebody who's been smoking all their lives and they're in their 80s. They usually die before. But if you find somebody who's been, drink, uh, been smoking since they were 10 years old and they're 80 years old, that is a... That's, that person has one powerful liver. Uh, caffeine, of course, the average consumption of caffeine for the elderly is about two uh, cups of brewed coffee a day. That's 200 milligrams. Uh, 200 milligrams, uh, how many milligrams are there in a Mountain Dew? Uh, 57, I think. So that's what, four cans of Mountain Dew, two cups of coffee, four cans of Mountain Dew. Caffeine toxicity can be uh, seen in doses as low as 100 milligrams. When seniors use excessive caffeine, it can lead to loss of bone density, increasing the possibility of hip fractures. And this is a really serious problem for females. Females tend to be more sensitive to caffeine than males are. And for that reason, of course, they are more susceptible. Their hips are wider and they are at a different angle, so it's much easier. It's, women break their hips a lot more frequently than men. Now here's, a, here's a reality for you. And I hate to give you these statistics, but the reality is that uh, if a person breaks their hip, they have a 50 they have a 50 percent chance of dying within a year. Especially if the older they are, the greater the probability of them dying, because they can't get up, they can't move, they become sedentary. Once they become sedentary, it changes everything. And they are not. They may not survive if they don't get their lazy butt out of bed. And it's not the lazy butt. It's the fact that they're. It hurts. It hurts a lot. Hip uh, hips really uh, are very painful. Uh, we had a lady, sweet, sweet, sweet lady. Uh, she had osteoporosis, so her bones were like tissue paper. It was really <laughs> scary. But we got her on the. Uh, she she thought she broke her hip, so we brought her into the. Uh, into the clinic and I was taking her x-rays and uh, the doctor wanted a shot from, he wanted a shot uh, on her stomach and a shot on her back and he also wanted her on her side. Well, we were okay with the shot on her stomach, we were okay with the shot on her, on her uh, back, but when we tried to roll her over on her hip, guess what happened? It snapped. She was dead one week. And, uh, I killed that lady by rolling her over. I don't know what she was rolling over. She did it herself, but <laughs> I told her to. <laughs> I tried to help her. I, maybe I shouldn't have helped her. Anyway, she's, she died from her hip fracture, from her hip fracture. But she had osteoporosis. What's the probability of her surviving any longer? I don't know. If she had walked around on eggshells, maybe she wouldn't have been okay. Anyway, she died within a week. And 50% of people that uh, have a hip fracture, especially if they're over the age of 60, die within a year. That's just something to remember. Males don't fracture the hips very often, but women do it all the time, unfortunately. The most prevalent problem among elderly is alcohol. Six to 11% of elderly hospital admittance uh, show signs of alcoholism. Uh, the emergency room visits uh, find 14% of the elderly uh, seen show signs of alcoholism. 14%, is that higher than the regular population? Yeah, just a little bit higher, not very much higher. 20% of the elderly in psychiatric wards are alcoholic. 49% of the elderly in nursing homes are alcoholic. Really? Now why would that be? 
why would people in nursing homes be more prevalent, be more likely to have alcoholism? Why would that be? I'm sorry? Well, they're not even supposed to drink in there. What the hell are they doing drinking? <laughs> What's going on? Dude, go to the bar. A lot of the nursing homes are uh, Catholic. A lot of Catholics are alcoholics. Or they're, if they survive that. That doesn't sound right. Here, erase that. Because of the presenting medical problems, alcoholism is often overlooked by medical personnel. Uh, anyway, if they, if they live that long, they're more likely to be alcoholic. I have no actually have no reason for it. Alcohol affects the elderly so much more seriously than a younger individual because less efficiency of their liver, uh, decrease in body water, uh, they become dehydrated. Uh, one of the things we had to do with my mother, uh, she had a glass of water. We had that glass of water right next to her all the time because she was uh, she was dehydrated and she wouldn't drink anything and I kept telling her that she needed to drink so every time I saw her I told her drink that water you crazy old bat or whatever <laughs> we had an interesting relationship <laughs> but <laughs> she liked the water because the cat would jump up and start drinking would drink out of her glass and she thought that was funny uh, so anyway so she and the cat used to drink a lot of water Actually, they didn't drink very much water, but we had that glass of water in front of her all the time. Uh, old people don't like to get up and pee, so they don't, they don't drink as much water. My dad used to do that. Uh, if he was going on a trip, he wouldn't drink or he wouldn't drink anything. Of course, you know he never stops to <coughs> urinate. <laughs> so by the time he gets to the end of his trip, he's dehydrated. Uh, he did this all of his life. It was a trick that he used, uh, that he learned in, in the army. Um, and uh, he did it all of his life. But uh, by the time he got into his 80s, uh, this was not a very good trick to pull. He needed to stop more frequently. Uh, and of course, he got dehydrated. And it was more debilitating for him. Uh, increase in sensitivity to alcohol, of course, decrease in tolerance to alcohol, a decrease in the metabolism of alcohol in the gastrointestinal tract. Lower amounts of alcohol will lead to intoxication for, for the elderly, uh, so they're a cheap drunk. It's a lot easier for them to get drunk than it is for uh, younger people. Uh, Over-the-counter medications can cause the elderly problems. Uh, sedatives contain antihistamines uh, for their sedating effect. And the liquid forms have more alcohol than wine does. Uh, Unisom, Sleepies, Nitol, Somonex. Uh, of course, I don't use any sleep aids. I don't need them. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of people that they can't go to sleep unless they have their, their uh, Somonex. Cold medications will contain the same combination of alcohol and antihistamines. And of course, antihistamines dehydrate you, as does alcohol. Abuse of prescription drugs has uh, been reported as low as 5% and as high as 33%. This occurs even in the extended care facilities. Uh, benzodiazepines are used by 71% by of the elderly between 50 and 65, and 33% of those over 65. These drugs can cause confusion and falls, and that's the biggest problem with sedating individuals that are older. Everybody has to get up and go to the bathroom. Well, the problem is that uh, these individuals, if you're giving them barbiturates, if you're giving them benzodiazepines, Valium to make their to, to reduce their anxiety level, then you're, what you're going to do is you're going to make them fall. Well, we just talked about how frequently uh, falling breaks your hip, and if you break your hip, you're dead within a year. Well, you have a 50-50 chance of being dead within a year. So this is a really serious problem, falls. Uh, I had a neighbor that, uh, boy, that, that old bat, she, she hung on for, she was in her 90s. And this lady is just, she loved to go to funerals. What the hell is all that all about? <laughs> she liked to go to funerals. And so somebody would have to take her, if somebody died that she knew, she'd have to go to their funeral. It's just crazy. And here she is, she's 95, 96 years old. Uh, and she was doing fine until the doctors decided 
that uh, that uh, she was too uh, anxious, and they so they started giving her uh, Valium. And once they gave her Valium, she fell down. And once she, she broke her she broke her arm. She didn't break her hip, but she really broke her arm bad. Uh, they tried to pin it, and uh, it didn't heal because she's well. She's 95 years old. Her healing capacity was fairly poor, uh, and it, and she died within a year. And it was mainly because the doctor gave her Valium. I guess they could have sued him. I don't know. It's kind of strange. They were waiting for the old. Oh, I'm not going to say that. They were waiting for her to die so they could take the house. <laughs> She finally did. Maybe it was, <laughs> maybe the family decided that they would try to kill her off <laughs> with Valia. I don't know. It's a crazy family. Abuse of prescription opioid analgesics uh, has increased by 500% since 1990. Oxycontin, hydrocodone, uh, Vicodin, Lortab, and Norco are uh, types of hydrocodone. Uh, as horrible as that sounds. Um, while few think of the elderly as drug abusers, uh, of the total hospital admissions for the elderly, 20% are directly due to prescription or over-the-counter drug reactions exclusive of alcohol and illicit drug admissions. So the reality is these guys are taking all this stuff and it's uh, sometimes the uh, one drug will interfere with the other and of course now we've got a problem. 20% uh, of the elderly were regular drinkers and continue to exceed controllable amounts, about 12% of men and 2% of women. 80% of, of senior arrests are for drunkenness, as confusing as that may be. Uh, primary prevention for the elderly, the elderly uh, needed to be, need to be educated as to the changing effects of alcohol and the drugs as they get older and the increased dangers of excessive use. This is a problem that we, re that we had when we were trying to find a doctor for my mother. As she got older, the doctors that knew about uh, geriatrics was very limited, and the geriatric doctors didn't like old people in my hometown, uh, so we were having a hard time finding somebody to take care of my mother. Uh, secondary prevention, secondary prevention with this age group involves recognizing the early stages of alcohol and drug addiction and appropriate interve intervention tactics. Usually these people are not addicts because they've been addicts for an extended length of time. If somebody's a heroin addict, they don't make it into their 50s. If somebody's an alcoholic, they don't make it into their 80s. It just doesn't happen. They usually die. But these people are picking up their habits later in life because they're depressed. They're self-medicating. Uh, they've got nothing to do but watch Matlock on television or whatever. Or Golden Girls. God, that television show is so depressing. All those old bats just nagging at each other. It's horrible. My wife watches that show and I hate it. I, uh, especially who's the tall one? The mean one. Dorothy. What's her name? Oh, God, I hate her. She's just got a horrible, horrible voice. <laughs> My wife just loves it because it gives me the wind back. I can't even go to bed while she's watching that show because that Dorothy's voice, like it, it, uh, it goes through concrete. So <laughs> I'd have to go outside and see in the barn. Uh, tertiary prevention uh, uh, treatment for elderly involves a slower pace of therapy, focusing on patience and reassurance. Tough to deal with with the old, with old people. Anyway, so that's that's that. Let's talk about prescription drugs. This is really important stuff. Um, this lecture I uh, stole off the internet. Uh, I changed it uh, so that it made a lot made more sense. Uh, this was a, a lecture that was given by a doctor to pre-med students or to, to medical students. Um, this, the sad thing is that uh, doctors do not get very much, uh, they don't get very much training in using medications, pharmaceuticals. They'll have maybe one or two classes. This represents one of the classes, as sad as that is. They don't really deal with, uh, with psychotropic drugs. They don't, they don't do that because uh, that is the purview of, uh, that is the purview of, uh, of psychiatrists and psychologists. So they don't understand this stuff. They have no clue. 
uh, but of course some kid comes in with ADHD and they immediately give them uh, methylphenidate, uh, Ritalin, uh, in order to take care of the ADHD. If somebody comes in with uh, depression, they juice them up with uh, Prozac right away and never think a, a second thing about it. But, of course, Prozac, uh, well, of all the drugs, Prozac has less uh, drug interaction uh, than any of, the, uh, any of the other drugs. Okay. Uh, the most popular drug in the world, of course, is, uh, is uh, Viagra. As it turns out, it's Viagra. We're not going to talk about Viagra. It's not a psychotropic. Uh, but uh, psychotropic drugs have been the most popular drugs for probably 50 or 60 years until Viagra was invented. Uh, now, of course, uh, people use the, the uh, Valium was the most popular drug until the 1990s. And in the 1990s, uh, its number one position was taken by Prozac. And then Prozac was the number one drug for an extended length of time until they invented uh, Viagra. And now Viagra is the number one drug in the world, as confusing as that is. So, but for uh, the longest time, we had psychotropics that were the... Uh, uh, most widely prescribed drugs in the world. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor uh, antidepressants. Um, the, uh, we're, we're primarily going to talk about Prozac, uh, Paxil, and Zoloft. Uh, but there are other uh, SSRIs. Uh, the mechanism of action for SSRIs, they inhibit serotonin reuptake. Uh, so it increases the synaptic serotonin levels uh, in the uh, their system. Uh, many SSRIs affect other receptors, especially at high doses. Uh, so it's not only affecting the, uh, the serotonin, it's also affecting the norepinephrine receptors, and sometimes the dopamine receptors. Uh, the clinical effect usually takes weeks, so mechanism goes beyond simply increasing synaptic serotonin levels. Uh, takes can take from uh, four to six weeks. Uh, to get a, uh, a, uh, a heavy enough dosage to really change somebody's mood. There are several serotonin receptor subtypes. Uh, serotonin receptors are located throughout the body, especially in your gut, as confusing as that is. Indications of off-label uses, uh, all except uh, Luvox uh, is approved by the FDA uh, to, to treat uh, depression. Uh, and usually that, that includes uh, major depressive disorder and dysthymia. Dysthymia, of course, is the blues. Various class members are also approved to treat generalized anxiety disorder, OCD, panic disorder, uh, PTSD, eating disorders, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, and social anxiety disorder. Off-label uses uh, of, anti of SSRIs, uh, we use it to treat ADHD. Uh, that's usually an individual that uh, has depressive symptoms as well as hyperactivity. Uh, we can use it to treat insomnia, and it works. Uh, of course, it takes four to six weeks for it to get into your system. Uh, chronic pain syndromes, uh, we treat it with SSRIs. Seasonal affective disorder, of course. Uh, you guys don't have to worry about that down here because uh, you're so far south that uh, uh, you, you get a lot of sun, sunshine in the, in the wintertime. Uh, behavioral problems in individuals with dementia and intellectual disability are other off-label uses of SSRIs. Uh, the half-life of, uh, of, of uh, some SSRIs are not the same. Uh, short half-life, uh, Luvox and Paxil uh, have uh, short half-lives. So if it, an individual uh, misses a dose, uh, they will become uncomfortable. Usually the, the uncomfortableness has to do with uh, nausea and sometimes vomiting, uh, as interesting as that is. Uh, moderate uh, SSRI, uh, Half-Life, Zoloft, Selexa, and Lexapro. My wife takes Lexapro. Uh, in 2003, I... <laughs> I took a trip to South America, South America and Central America with a uh, Fulbright, uh, it was a Fulbright trip. Uh, and I was gone for six weeks in the summertime. And during that time, my wife got depressed because she missed me so much. <laughs> I was such a delightful person, she couldn't live without me, and here I was. I was down in South and Central America. 
Uh, and of course, she started having all these strange ideas that, that somebody on the, the trip was going to seduce me, like that was going to happen. Um, you know, that I, I don't know. I get stuck in a, uh, <laughs> I don't know, in one of the Inca villages or something, and some strange Kichwei woman would pull me off to her cave or something. <laughs> I had no idea what was on her mind. Anyway, so they started giving her Lexapro. Uh, to take care of her anxiety and her depression, and it works. Uh, but of course, it has a, uh, uh, a moderate half-life. Uh, like I said, my wife forgets things from time to time. It's not because she has dementia. She just doesn't think about it. She just keeps telling me, well, I was on, you know, I was on Facebook. Anyway, so sometimes she forgets. And when she does, she gets sick. Uh, she gets uh, nausea. She gets nauseous, and sometimes she starts to vomit. Uh, one of the reasons that we get, we hand out so much Prozac is because it has a long uh, half-life. Uh, it's, it's good for people that miss doses all the time, for people that don't remember things. Uh, Prozac works. Works, and of course, we can give somebody a dose, and we don't have to worry about uh, uh, if they miss the, the next dose eight hours later that they're going to have some kind of a horrible reaction. Side effects of SSRIs, uh, decreased sex drive. This is the, the thing that people complain about more than anything else. It, has a, uh, it causes a decreased sex drive and impaired sexual functioning, uh, and this doesn't go away. It just stays there. So if you react this negatively to, uh, to uh, Prozac or whatever else you're taking, uh, then uh, it's going to stay there, and it's going to stay there until you go off this medication. Uh, the other side effects, nausea, diarrhea, anorexia, vomiting, uh, all, of, uh, all of these are worse with increased dosages, uh, and it doesn't go away with uh, time, or sometimes it can be. Uh, weight gain with uh, Paxil, Paroxetine, uh, but of course Paroxetine also gives you diarrhea and vomiting, so you have uh, GI effects. Headache, dizziness, anxiety with uh, Paxil. Uh, rash, insomnia, sedation, uh, sweating, vivid dreams, tremor and dry mouth, uh, bruising, increased prolactin uh, level, and of course that will change your digestive, digestive tract. Uh, but it can cause vivid dreams, and a lot of people complain about this, about the vivid dreams, uh, because they're scary, they're, real, they're very realistic. And because they're very realistic, people are afraid that, of course, they're going to react uh, negatively to them. Uh, it's almost like uh, hallucinations or, or delusions. I mean, it's, it's, it's that bad. Drug-to-drug uh, -drug, uh, interactions, uh, Luvox, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Celexa, and Lexapro, the interact, uh, interacting effects may be uh, dose-dependent, especially with Zoloft. Uh, so we have to be very careful as to if we are going, if we give somebody Zoloft, what other drugs they're taking. Uh, some, of the, some of the drugs we don't have to worry about. We can give it to anybody, and we don't have to worry about what drugs they're using. Uh, this can be a really serious problem, especially if you're dealing with somebody that uses uh, illegal drugs or somebody that's using uh, prescription drugs in, in, incorrectly. Uh, you know, we can get all kinds of interesting uh, side effects. SSRI levels uh, tend not to be altered by other drugs but can potentially increase levels. Uh, they can inhibit metabolism of certain drugs. Uh, for example, Paxil will increase Risperidone. Risperidone, of course, is uh, the antipsychotic. Uh, Prozac will increase Buspirone, uh, Meprobamate. Uh, that is a um, anti-anxiety anti drug and an antidepressant. Luvox will increase uh, Zyprexa. Zyprexa is one of the Z drugs. It's one of the um, <laughs> it's it's one of the sleep aids. Uh, Salmonex, I think, is Zyprexa. Anyway, okay. So, uh, so you're taking Luvox. All of a sudden, your doctor gives you Luvox, and uh, you you can't sleep that night. So you take a uh, Zyprexa. What happens next? Well, hopefully you wake up the next morning, probably you wake up the next afternoon. You're probably going to sleep for 12, uh, 12 to 16 hours. This can be really serious. People can die from this kind of stuff, unfortunately.
So you have to be careful. Uh, cautions, there are there is increased suicidal ideation and increased suicide risk, especially with children early in treatment, but there is significant debate about the dangers. Uh, some people will have committed suicide, especially teenagers. When we're talking about uh, children, we're talking about people that are under the age of 18. Uh, we have a lot of depressed uh, teenage kid, teenagers. Uh, for the longest time, of course, uh, we weren't giving them Prozac because we were afraid they would have a negative reaction. They would commit suicide. Uh, so this is always a possibility. Uh, wh why in the world would an antidepressant uh, make you commit suicide? I mean, if you're depressed, then you commit suicide. But here we're giving you a drug that makes you not depressed anymore. Why would that lead to suicide? From, from the medication itself? Well, we're yeah. still, we're we're still taking it. It's, it's the people that take it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Committing suicide. So some of the drugs. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is very confusing. You commit suicide when you're depressed. You take a drug that makes you not depressed anymore, and then you commit suicide. How could that possibly work? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? Uh, kind of, kind of. It has to do with inhibitions. So while you are depressed, you're 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 not killing yourself because you have these inhibitions. So you stay, start to take the drug, and the drug takes away your inhibitions. Now all of a sudden, you're not depressed anymore, but you also have this idea in your head that you can do it, that you were supposed to have committed suicide or you have these suicidal ideations. And now, of course, you, you, you can do it because you're, the inhibition that keeps you from putting the gun in your head and pulling the trigger is, not, is no longer there. So your inhibitions are gone. And that's why, that's why these individuals will commit suicide. It's really kind of, kind of interesting. I know it seems backwards, doesn't it? <clears throat> but alcohol does the same thing. Well, alcohol will take away your inhibitions. And now, suddenly, you can dance. You've never been able to dance before. Everybody always laughs at you when you try to dance. But now, you don't care. Your inhibitions are gone, so you get out there and start flailing around, right? <laughs> I know, this is too funny. <laughs> oh, man. Serotonin syndrome, uh, <laughs> uh, SSRIs plus MAOIs, and possibly lithium and others, if you put them all together, uh, you may get what they refer to as, as serotonin syndrome. Why is this serious? Uh, it causes diarrhea and tremors, sweating, restlessness, and hyperreflexia. Uh, this, this can be a, a really serious problem uh, because the symptoms get worse and worse and worse. You become disoriented, uh, rigidity and fever. Uh, eventually, potentially, you will go into a coma. You'll have seizures, and it's got a 10% mortality rate. Some people are hypersensitive to SSRIs, and they can't take SSRIs with anything, with, especially with any other psychotropic. Now, remember when I was talking about bipolar disorder, a lot of times we treat it with lithium, uh, and it brings, your, it brings your norepinephrine level down. Well, these people will not stay on that because it, it, uh, it has dulled their senses. They like that feeling of mania. It's almost like being on speed. So in order to keep them from committing suicide, we have to raise their, their mood level. And we do that with SSRIs. So a lot of times, we treat uh, bipolar disorder not only with lithium and with the anti-seizure medi medication, but also with an SSRI. Now that's okay as long as they don't develop serotonin syndrome. If they're hypersensitive to these things, then potentially they will uh, they will uh, eventually die. I mean, they will die from uh, all of the uh, all the medications that they're taking. And of course, you need to keep an eye on this stuff. Now, the problem is, of course, that doctors don't always keep a good eye on things. And because of that, then th these individuals who are taking their lithium religiously, just like they're supposed to, and their SSRIs religiously, just like they're supposed to, they have developed serotonin syndrome. And of course, they only have to go in every month. Well, the serotonin syndrome will develop in, in a matter of days. So here, all of a sudden, they've got a negative reaction. 
And of course they have bipolar disorder. They don't want to go to the doctor. They don't like going to the doctor anyway because he's always giving them stuff that makes them feel bad. So they don't go in. Or they go into the emergency room and, and uh, they don't pick up on it. They don't pick up on the serotonin syndrome. Uh, and the person dies. Uh, many medication substances have serotonin activity. Dextromethorphan uh, has, a, has a serotonin activity, as does fentanyl, uh, dimerol, uh, sumatriptan, sumatriptan uh, St. John's wort. This is an herbal. Uh, they don't use Prozac in Europe as much as we do in the United States. They use this stuff. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried this stuff. Uh, St. John's wort. Uh, I took it for a while and it didn't do jack to me. It, I mean, it didn't feel any different. I just, I can't remember why I took it. It was supposed to make you younger or something. I don't remember. Anyway, MDMA, of course, uh, increases uh, serotonin anyway. LSD, there's just tons of stuff that increase your serotonin level. So you have to be really careful as far as taking medications. Uh, fluoxetine or Prozac, uh, fluoxetine is, is actually the chemical name for it. Um, <laughs> you cannot take it with uh, Zyprexa. You can't take uh, a... Um, you should really stay away from... Uh, sleep aids uh, if you're taking antidepressants. Uh, fluoxetine, of course, Prozac, has a very long half-life. Uh, it uh, has significant drug-to-drug -drug interaction, and this is one of the reasons why it is not the most popular, uh, actually it is the most popular SSRI, uh, but uh, if you're taking anything else, you really sh shouldn't uh, be taking Prozac. Uh, it can be activating, I'm not exactly sure what that means, only doctors understand that. Selexa, of course, is another SSRI. Uh, it has few drug interactions, and for that reason, people will give uh, somebody Selexa over Prozac. It has a high serotonin specificity. It's uh, typical or less SSRI side effects. It has less uh, uh, SSRI side effects. Uh, this is the stuff that my wife takes, Lexapro. Uh, they, it, uh, is very, it's relatively simple, and it, it uh, uh, it's an anti-anxiety drug as well as a uh, as a an antidepressant. Uh, Luvox uh, is the one that's not approved by the FDA. Uh, we give that for OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, it has multiple significant uh, drug to drug interactions, and for that reason, of course, we have to be very careful with it. Uh, Paxil, paroxetine, uh, significant drug to drug interaction, and for that reason, of course. Uh, it is uh, a drug that we give uh, individually, uh, not, with, uh, not when they're taking other drugs. Uh, some reports of associated weight gain, and this is something that a lot of people complain about, uh, the fact that they're gaining weight because of the pills. Uh, withdrawal symptoms with missed doses, and that uh, because it has a, such a short uh, half-life, of course, and that's the reason uh, the Paxil causes those problems. Uh, Zoloft is, has moderate drug-to-drug -drug interaction. Uh, it has multi-step dosing. Um, if somebody is suffering from postpartum depression, we'll give them Zoloft uh, because of the uh, uh, because it doesn't uh, usually interfere with other with other drugs. Uh, the other drugs also uh, reduce the sex drive. Uh, Zoloft not so much. Um, this is post uh, postpartum uh, since they, the the individual has just given birth. Uh, they have a drop in their progesterone level, uh, which makes them a little bit more, more likely to be depressed. Uh, Zoloft works for this. Uh, it keeps them from going into uh, postpartum psychosis. Well, it's supposed to. A the atypical antidepressants, uh, newer antidepressants that are not less, uh, not or have less serotonin specificity or affect the serotonin differently than SSRIs. Uh, Desiril uh, was, uh, was discovered in 1981. Uh, it's also known as trazodone. Uh, if you know anybody that's a Vietnam vet, then potentially they took trazodone and Desiril. Uh, they used it to treat PTSD. Uh, so a lot of uh, Vietnam vets uh, use that stuff, or have used it in the past. Uh, by this time, of course, they shouldn't be taking trazodone anymore. Uh, well, butrin. 
uh, was discovered in 1989. Uh, Effexor came along in, uh, in 1993. Effexor is used for postmenopausal women. Uh, very frequently, they have anxiety problems. They have a, de uh, a decline in their estrogen and their progesterone level. And for that reason, a lot of times the, the, react, rea the uh, mood reaction is that they have uh, that they have anxiety and they have depression uh, because of the progesterone and the estrogen. Uh, so rather than giving give them estrogen therapy, uh, which causes breast cancer, they give them Effexor instead. Uh, my wife didn't like it, uh, so finally she went off of the Fexer, and then about a month, not a month, about a year later, she went back on the Fexer because she was depressed. She didn't have anxiety, she had depression. It's sad. Don't cry. Uh, the, the, the Cerazone uh, was discovered in 1994, uh, Remeron in 1996. Uh, Cerazone discontinued, uh, was discontinued. Uh, the, there are generics of serazone that are still available. We're going to talk about some of the horrible side effects of, of some of these drugs. Cymbalta, you probably have heard of Cymbalta. Uh, they advertise it on television now. They want you to take it with your, if you have, uh, if you're bipolar, uh, because it uh, raises your mood. Uh, so if you're not reacting properly to your medication that you're taking, you need to take Cymbalta. Uh, so this, we're, we're, now we're giving them Cymbalta rather than Prozac or Zoloft or Paxil, Cymbalta. Okay, we need to stop right here. We'll pick this up next time with atypical antidepressants and all the other fun stuff.